Hello, everyone. Hi, Ron. Hi, Arun. Thank you for being here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you on board in uh, this very special webinar about the uh, software supply chain, uh, specifically for the automotive industry. This is the first time that we're doing an industry-specific webinar. Uh, before we start talking about uh, the real stuff, let's uh, introduce everybody here. <laughs> Arun, uh, let's start with you. Um, first of all, thanks for being here. <laughs> My pleasure. So, <clears throat> Arun de Souza is an award-winning thought leader and keynote speaker with over two decades of experience as a CISO in the automotive industry. He has developed and implemented award-winning programs for identity lifecycle management and IoT security. His areas of expertise include identity management, zero trust, cloud computing, strategic planning, risk management, and privacy. Arun has earned numerous industry Accolades including CISO Hall of Fame Award by the Global Cyber Startup Observatory, a top global CISO award by Cyber Defense Magazine. Again, thank you very much for being here with us. Ron. <clears throat> uh, Ron is the VP of Strategy and Product at Argus Cybersecurity. He is a global leader in the automotive cybersecurity. In this role, Ron oversees the product strategy roadmap and planning for all Argus product lines, including the recently launched DevSecOps platform, in-vehicle security solutions, fleet protection technologies, and anti-theft solutions. Prior to joining Argus, Ron held various leadership positions in the cybersecurity sector, including a tenure at Microsoft Security, where he led the development of an innovative integrated security solution for the IoT devices. At Checkpoint, Ron led the innovative XDR solution from inception, contributing to the protection of corporate enterprises and governments worldwide. A pleasure to have you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, 60 seconds on myself. Uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Scribe Security. Scribe is a provider of software supply chain security platform, applying the concepts of continuous uh, assurance and zero trust to protect software. Before that, I co-founded and served as the managing partner at Resilience Cybersecurity, which was a cyber and cryptography professional services firm. And uh, before that, I also served as a VP at the Argus Cybersecurity uh, for three years. Argus is a cybersecurity company for automotive, but I've led the aviation business unit there. And uh, today uh, I'm doing Skype. <laughs> so um, let's start with a, a short background about how did we get here? how uh, cars and cybersecurity, which used to be very different uh, domains, uh, converged, and how specifically safety and security converged to be one thing in the cyber, in the automotive industry, especially now with all the autonomous fleets and autonomous cars that are actually our computer on wheels. And the best person to lead us to this domain is uh, Arun. So Arun, this is a question for you. Uh, please take it from here. Thank you, uh, Ruby. Uh, the convergence of technology and connected vehicles in the fourth industrial revolution has raised automotive cybersecurity to a mission critical global issue. Manufacturers across the world uh, must demonstrate a laser focus beyond data protection and privacy to being guardians of human lives, like you noted, uh, Ruby. Now, the modern day era of connected and autonomous vehicles elevates automotive cybersecurity to mission critical cornerstone for cybersecurity and safety assurance. Software vulnerabilities have the potential to be exploited by bad actors, resulting in collisions and life-threatening scenarios. 
The need to design and deploy the appropriate administrative, physical, and technical safeguards across the software deployment lifecycle, popularly called the SDLC, and minimize exponential risk has raised the stakes for all auto manufacturers. Now, within a connected car, the inherent complex array of interconnected software sensors uh, is a gateway to potential cyber threats. The need to protect against unauthorized access to vehicle systems by hackers and bad actors is imperative to avoid or eliminate catastrophic consequences, including but not limited to loss of human life and injury, running the gamut from privacy breaches to subsume control of auto operations. For reference, cyber attacks on cars have soared 225% in the past three years for Upstream, a cybersecurity and data management platform. Now, with that preamble, autonomous cars are dependent on complex software algorithms to navigate and make split-second decisions. Software vulnerabilities may enable software compromise which in essence endangers passengers, pedestrians, and other vehicles. Digital trust is necessary in the modern day as illustrated by the public's response to classic IT hacks and breaches in the past. I think Ran will take us through some of those in, coming up shortly. Valuing and fulfilling people's trust in these game-changing technologies is absolutely imperative. The table stakes are extremely high for the automotive industry from a dual perspective, what I call the two prime directives. Number one, assure trust and confidence for vehicle owners globally, and then provide tailwinds to propel connected and autonomous vehicle development forward safely and securely. Thus, it must be noted that one or more cybersecurity incidents in the world can imperil gravely these two prime directives, right? <clears throat> so in closing for this particular introduction, the quest to safeguard modern day vehicles against cyber attack, we are host of measures ranging from certificates, data encryption, secure authentication to intrusion detection systems is essential to effectively balance innovation and human safety. Regulatory agencies worldwide are intent on promulgating and mandating rigorous automotive cybersecurity standards for compliance. Thank you, Ruby. Thank you, Arun, for this very elaborative uh, background. I think that's a very good uh, way to, to enter into this domain of cybersecurity and automotive. Uh, now, our, uh, we, we are focusing on software supply chain, and the software supply chain is one uh, subdomain of cybersecurity. And Ron, here I want to address the next question to you. Uh, focusing on software supply chain attacks, can you tell us a little bit why the automotive industry is more suspect susceptible to such attacks uh, specifically, maybe more than other industries or the uh, IT industry? Certainly. Thank you, Ruby. Um, so, so first, thank you, Arun. It's, it's what you pointed is we see the same. Uh, in the last couple of years, we have been, we have seen a notable surge in cyber uh, attacks targeting the automotive uh, sector. That's certainly something that's certainly a trend that we also identify. Supply chains within the automotive industry experience actually the highest number of detections, by the way, across different supply chains, because it's obviously not just that unique to automotive, but in automotive, and we'll discuss it, I guess, later on, uh, supply chains are a critical element within the overall industry. That's, you know, every OEM manufacturer uses sometimes hundreds of different uh, subcontractors, tier ones, tier twos, and, 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 and so on. So this is a major concern across many of our customers because, you know, we work in this industry. Uh, they are very much concerned 
Uh, and according to most of them, actually, I think there, there's a recent survey showed that uh, almost uh, two thirds, uh, I think it was exactly, uh, the exact number was about 64, 65% of uh, automotive industry leaders believe that their supply chain is vulnerable to cyber attacks. Many businesses understand that they are not well prepared for the connected uh, era of, of cars. And that's, that's a major concern. Now, before we jump into some examples or discuss it in a little bit more detail, maybe let's first explain what a software supply chain attack is, is all about, right? So basically, a software supply chain attack is a cyber attack where malicious actors uh, compromise the software development or distribution process, by the way, uh, to insert malicious code into legit otherwise legitimate uh, software. Distributing this compromised software can lead to potential security breaches uh, or other security risks, you know, the ability to, uh, to take control over your car and, 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 and concerns and threats like that. So these attacks can target various points uh, in the supply chain. It could be in the source code, uh, in different repositories, uh, in your build processes or update mechanisms, for example, it could, you know, hackers can uh, try to attack different uh, uh, points uh, in the development process. Open source specifically, presents the highest risk of, uh, of, of supply chain attacks, because this is obviously open source projects often rely on numerous, sometimes unknown contributors, third party libraries and other components, which may not always undergo the, you know, the usual rigorous uh, uh, security uh, vetting that, that you would expect at least internally, or you can implement uh, internally. And attackers can exploit vulnerabilities in these components very easily. So that's why uh, open source for me represents the, the biggest uh, uh, concern. Uh, now, specifically talking about the automotive uh, uh, industry, uh, first I mentioned before the complex uh, supply chain. Uh, the automotive industry relies on a vast and very intricate network of suppliers and sub-suppliers, tier one, tier twos, sometimes even tier threes. This complexity creates basically multiple entry points. So it's very easy to find an entry point which is not well guarded. Uh, and eventually you can trickle all your way, all your way up to you know, the OEM uh, itself. Now, on the other hand, uh, exactly like also you mentioned, and I actually have a slide for that. Um, I can use this one just to at least give some uh, uh, ballpark numbers, if you will. Uh, when we talk about the extensive use of software in modern vehicles, we see that these the numbers are amazing. Uh, because of software, because of SDV, software defined vehicles, uh, more software is used. And basically, the attack surface is now much, much bigger than it used to be. And it's only going to grow, exactly like you said, Arun, uh, with autonomous driving, autonomous vehicles. It's, it's only going to grow and become easier. Connectivity adds to that because modern vehicles are now connected to the internet, and basically it's opening the door to hackers to take uh, uh, control. But there are, don't forget the other uh, 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 surfaces, such as Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and solar networks. It's becoming easier and easier. The attack surface is growing basically every day. Uh, I mentioned extensive use of uh, third-party software, which is also very common across multiple industries. In the automotive industry, it's highly driven by the economic pressure, reducing costs and speed of production that, that is required, sometimes lead to shortcuts and, and other security, well, not the best uh, security practices, let's say it this way. So rigorous testing and validation of software are time consuming, they're expensive, and some, uh, let's say certainly not the top tier uh, uh, suppliers, but some sometimes uh, leave them apart, leave them aside because it's it's too expensive, and that's a major concern in the industry. 
Uh, last but not least is the long product uh, life cycle, right? It's a car. At the end of the day, a car, the, the uh, average uh, life cycle of a car is about 15 years now. It's going down a little bit. Sometimes it's uh, 13, 14, but we're talking many years. Uh, think that, you know, think about software that was developed 15 years ago. Security wasn't even an issue back then. So probably <laughs> no one thought about, you know, security by design, shift left, all these new words and new terms. No one thought about it. So often you'll see insufficient, insufficient uh, security measures that were implemented, and it's 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 a major issue in this industry. Yeah, hey, Ron, uh, that's really great. Uh, I just had a quick little, uh, couple of things. Uh, you know, you talked about the supply chain, and you know the extended automotive supply chain ecosystem has like an enormous amount of suppliers, right? And as we have a famous saying. The chain is as strong as its weakest link. So any chinks in the arm of any supply chain constituent can be a pathway for exposure to software and or hardware vulnerabilities to automobiles. Therefore, as you noted, it's paramount to ensure that ecosystem vendors and suppliers have strong security. Now, that's easier said than done. I realize that, right? Whereas it's complex and endeavor, it is critical to have a periodic review of third party policies and practices. And you know, to the extent possible, uh, have security and risk questionnaires, and even I hope one day comes a common framework for auditing suppliers so that we can assess where they are at, right? And of course, obviously, if your company of any kind, a third-party risk management platform uh, is uh, very important to provide a balanced scorecard of cyber risk across the entire cyber supply chain ecosystem. Excellent points. I agree. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would add <clears throat> a room to your point that I think that uh, from a, an attacker perspective, it is very cost efficient, uh, cost effective to, to, to take the attack vector of uh, software supply chain, uh, mainly because of two reasons. The first one is that the, the biggest OEMs have very big budgets and very big security <laughs> engineering teams. And they are doing a fairly good job in protecting themselves, in protecting the perimeters. And they, they have a lot of resources to invest in this. And small companies that are uh, Q2, Q3 um, have much less resources. They have innovation, but they don't have the awareness and uh, sometimes the regulatory requirements and uh, the resources overall to invest in it. And it is much easier to attack them and through them to get to the tier ones and to the OEMs. So this is one reason. And the second reason is that the earlier that you get in in the software, in the software supply chain, the wider, uh, usually the wider your impact is. So for example, if I will provide a few examples from not from the automotive industry, but from the last uh, three years, then the recent XZ utils that uh, was inserted, almost inserted in, into almost all of the Linux distributions in the world uh, could reach millions and, or maybe multi-millions of uh, computers and ECUs. And uh, in the solo wins case, uh, they attacked the Orion uh, agent and then it reached 18,000 of their customers. And in the 3CX uh, incident, uh, actually, this was a double software supply chain attack. Uh, this was a communication uh, company that was attacked by the North Koreans. They reached almost 100,000 of uh, impacted. So uh, from <laughs> From a, an attacker perspective, if you want to make a lot of damage and to make it very wide, to get into millions of cars, the best way is to just uh, do it early in the supply chain. All right, uh, let's move to what the, the governments and what the regulators are doing about this. And this is the, the compliance part. I mean, the compliance can uh, can arrive from, from governments and from institutions such as the United Nations and uh, uh, from, from others, but also from uh, customers, right? If an OEM 
uh, requires something, then if you want to continue doing business, then you, you need to comply. And here, uh, Ron is a practitioner in a cybersecurity company that is obliged uh, to such uh, requirements. I'm very curious to hear your perspective on uh, what the, the standards and the regulation of this specific industry are becoming. Excellent, thank you. So maybe just before I answer that, I'll just uh, again share one slide, just to uh, connect that sure. to reality, by the way. Um, I quickly pulled up uh, an example where actually a supply chain attack uh impact uh, i guess everybody knows toyota one of the biggest uh, uh oem manufacturer uh and basically uh in 2022 toyota announced the suspensions of 20 something operations uh, uh operation lines across uh, 14 plants in uh, japan due to a cyber attack on one of its suppliers so it's exactly like you said the room and ruby uh, you're as secured as your weakest link and because this is a very long chain between the all the tiers it's very easy to exploit now I'll go back to what you asked I think it's uh actually then I I'll use this one to uh, mm -hmm. cover you know just the there are actually now a lot of regulations that cover supply chain uh, as well. But to kind of summarize, in, instead of going into the very details, because there is a lot, we, we just released uh, a regulatory uh, overview in different countries and different uh, um, regul regulatory bodies. And it's uh, already 350 pages long, and we haven't covered everything yet. So it's growing uh, every year with more and more regulations and recommendations. But basically, cybersecurity regulations significantly impact the uh, automotive industry in various ways. Basically, it's all about, or ultimately about, uh, uh, protecting consumers and increasing overall safety of cars. Again, exactly like you said, Arun, uh, security and safety are basically the two sides of the same coin. It's, uh, it's equally important, especially now that cars are, like I said, software on wheels. So regulations basically drive fundamental change in the automotive cyber industry in, I, I would say, three uh, different areas. First and foremost, uh, we see a lot of uh, what is now called shift left, security by design, there are different names for it, uh, but basically the approach that addresses security early in the design and development process, like Ruby mentioned. The other aspect uh, handled by the regulations uh, is cybersecurity management throughout the vehicle lifespan. As I mentioned, the vehicle lifespan can, if just, you know, just the life expectancy of the car on the road is about 15 years, and take you know a couple of years before the design and, and development of of a new car or we're, we're looking we're easily looking at about 20 years uh lifespan of of a development so it's important to uh address that early and throughout the life cycle including post deployment and the other important pillar that we see across multiple uh, regulations is the extension of responsibility, both to the executive level, even the board of directors of the OEMs, as well as across the automotive supply chain. That's another major uh, pillar in the uh, in, in the new and emerging uh, uh, regulations. Now you see here a couple of uh, uh, specific, very relevant. Uh, anyone in the automotive industry would recognize them, but UNR 155 that was adopted by the United uh, Nations uh, Economic uh, Commission. Uh, this regulation requires automakers to implement a cybersecurity management system 
CSMS uh, for anyone that uses the acronyms uh, to ensure that their vehicles are protected against cyber threats uh, throughout their life cycle. Uh, uh, ISO 21434 is a standard that provides guidelines for managing cybersecurity risks uh, in, in vehicles, and it emphasizes the need for risk-based approach uh, and best practices uh, uh, for security of automotive systems. So I can go on, you know, in, in more details uh, about NHTSA and best practices. I, I just highlighted the key elements, but like I said, the three pillars uh, are very much common across all the different regulations, whether are in the US, in China, uh, from the UN or specifically to EMEA. Uh, and we see the same requirements again and again. Um, and, and basically, the, uh, uh, these regulations, some of them already are in effect. Some of them will come into effect very soon. Uh, and over time, they grow and become more uh, detailed. And we see the, thereby the enhancing uh, trust of uh, products. You know, that, that's the goal, making sure that consumers feel safer and can trust the, the product that they are buying. And yeah. therefore, there are, I guess they are more likely to purchase vehicles from manufacturers that are adhering to, uh, to uh, these targets. And maybe later on, even, you know, we can see differentiation based on, 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 on uh, Cyber security readiness of those manufacturers. Yeah. Thank you, Ron. This was really helpful. And Arun, I, I'd like to ask you, as a, somebody who, who is in the in this industry, in the automotive industry, for more than two decades, and your experience, and you've seen how these uh, regulations evolved throughout these decades. Can you? take us into the, the history of how uh, it evolved, how the regulator evolved uh, from a safety issue into a cybersecurity issue in, the, in this industry? Absolutely. But first, uh, I wanted to say, well said, uh, Ryan, I particularly appreciated a couple of things that you talked about. Uh, one being that uh, cybersecurity and safety are two sides of the same coin, right? Uh, and then the notion of uh, trust, uh, you know, so that is really huge. So thank you for that. Now, <clears throat> from a historical perspective, automotive safety was under the purview of the engineering organization in many automotive companies, right? And this is days before the software defined vehicles like you, or the autonomous vehicles, as you said, ran, right? This is a new era now. Uh, however, as the demand and manufacture of connected and automotive cars started to rise, the fields of cybersecurity and human safety have converged. And in fact, I add one more sliver to your two-sided coin uh, ran, and that is data privacy is also huge too, because you know the amount of data that is being collected, you know, people could advertise wrongly, you could have privacy violation and so on. So Privacy is also as well huge. So what's now happened is the fact that if you look at organizationally, the history of good, robust software, de defined lifecycle STLC practices originated in the IT organization, right? So therefore it's only quite natural that the engineering organizations would start to collaborate more and more with IT function because you know they had known the know the recipes they've been there done that kind of a thing right and when you throw the lens of data privacy regulations as well now that's a bit uh, not so standardized sometimes data privacy is under legal sometimes it's under um, IT right uh, and uh, however IT is always front and center of it and CISOs normally in modern companies. They are like the ship's captain. They're looking into the future, looking at all, you know, the rocks and the storms out there, namely the cyber threats. And that's why many companies for all these areas, you know, the CISO becomes a trusted advisor uh, to lead change and foster and promote good practices. So I think it's not only the convergence of uh, the three areas of cybersecurity, data privacy, uh, and and safety uh, by nature, it's 
become bigger than any one organization. And in fact, we need a cross-functional collaboration and a federation of resources, not only across internal functions, but across the entire supply chain ecosystem, starting from the tier one manufacturers, to all these suppliers. And Ruby, you know, I appreciate what you said earlier, you know, not everybody has the same budget. And whereas the big manufacturers have bigger budgets, the smaller suppliers don't have budgets. And therefore, let me submit something else to you. I think it's an opportunity for, you know, those that have to help those that don't have as much. And maybe the bigger manufacturers can take the opportunity to share best practices, even have seminars or things to do to help, you know, small suppliers. Because at the end of the day, the more you invest in strengthening the supply chain, everybody benefits, right? Hope that resonated. Um, thank you, Arun. Um, it's really thoughtful. Um, I think maybe just to conclude the, the regulation part, uh, I, I think that we should mention that there is also a global, more general regulation that uh, in the United States is led by the federal government, uh, started by the Biden executive order 14028. And then uh, further developed by NIST uh, to become the NIST 800 218 uh, or SSDF, Secure uh, Software Development uh, Framework, that is going to be applicable to all the critical infrastructure. And uh, I think that aviation, transportation, automotive are uh, going to be part of those. And uh, in Europe, a little bit later, uh, there is the Cyber Resilience Act that is also going to be applicable for the automotive industry, of course. And it talks about uh, basically about um, shifting the burden of uh, proving that a, a product is a software is trustworthy to the shoulders of the software producer. <laughs> whereas uh, it was on the shoulders of the receiver. And I think these uh, huge regulations that are not industry specific to automotive, rather uh, more relevant for the entire critical infrastructure and regulated industries that the automotive is part of them are going to influence greatly on the automotive industry just as well. All right, let's, let's uh, move on to cover briefly the best practices that we see today and that are emerging. And Juan, maybe you want to start with what is required today in the automotive industry. Ah, certainly, thanks. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say, again, focusing on software supply chain uh, attacks, mm -hmm. uh, best practices in the industry uh, uh, focuses on several tools and technologies. First and foremost, are the uh, is is about security testing. So static static application security testing uh, tools that basically scan source code for security vulnerabilities. Uh, basically, it helps you detect SQL injections, uh, cross site uh, scripting, uh, buffer overflows, stuff like that. Dynamic application security testing are basically tools that analyze running applications to identify security vulnerabilities based on uh, uh, databases of vulnerability, known vulnerabilities. Uh, these tools basically simulate attacks uh, and find uh, issues like, like security misconfigurations, uh, authentication errors, stuff, stuff like that. Uh, a vulnerability management uh, tools uh, uh, are also a critical part of uh, the overall security strategy for supply chain attacks. Uh, it's basically a continuous process. That's how the regulations address it, because you also need to de detect an alert on vulnerabilities detected. Also, post-deployment, so when the car is already on the road. It's about identifying, classifying, prioritizing uh, many uh, uh, vulnerabilities uh, based on uh, regular scans and, and uh, obviously also updates or patching of, uh, uh, of detected uh, vulnerability. Everything is based on SBOM, uh, Software Bill of Material. 
which is a critical element in ensuring the organization uh, secure supply chain. Uh, but that, that's, that's a critical element, uh, maintaining an up to speed, uh, uh, an up to date, sorry, uh, software bill of material. Another element that is often used in development processes is uh, software composition analysis, basically because of the vast usage of uh, open source, uh, third party components and code bases like that. It's, it's a tool that also uh, makes sure that outdated uh, libraries uh, and even licensing issues are alerted during the development process. Basically, putting all together, uh, maybe with another element which is also very common today and mandatory uh, according to the regulations, which are in-vehicle agents. Basically, uh, that, that's the other side of the mitigation strategy because having something inside the car can basically help tie uh, response playbooks uh, and, and other capabilities to make sure that even virtual patching can take place even when the car has been released and is already deployed and being used. But the vision, I think, or what we see uh, this industry going into is uh, DevSecOps platforms, where you streamline the processes, automate all these security checks, uh, throughout the entire phase of uh, design and development. It helps collaboration across the development, uh, between the development teams and uh, the security teams and the CISO office, of course. It helps accelerate development uh, because, you know, continuous integration and you can do nightly tests and in the morning get full reports on what passed, what didn't pass, recommendations on, on, on what to improve. Uh, so improving uh, uh, this process, automating it by adopting uh, an integrated DevSecOps platform can help organizations to uh, better protect against software supply chain attacks and maintain agility and speed of uh, development, basically. Thanks, Van. So I, I, would, uh, I would like to... Um, add my, my insights uh, to, to those lines, along those lines. So I, I think that uh, what we are seeing uh, for software producers in the last 20 years is uh, basically more of the same. It's a scanner-based technology. As you said, it's a software composition analysis, SAS, DAS, the, the, the NIAS. And it's all about scanning code and also the regulations that you have uh, gone through. Uh, you can see that it's a lot about uh, vulnerabilities. <laughs> um, and this is really important. Uh, actually, I don't think it's a solved problem today, even though the SAS are getting better, but uh, there are many false positives and there is a lot of noise. And the problem today is many times how to make sense in, uh, in all the noise. Um, what we are seeing, and actually is uh, this is in line with the Biden executive order and the SSDF, uh, is that uh, vulnerabilities are very important. They need to be managed. They need to uh, be recognized and uh, throughout the entire life cycle of uh, a product but it's not everything. And uh, it covers like 20% of the scope of the problem. There are many attack vectors in software supply chain that has nothing to do with the uh, code vulnerabilities. For example, if uh, an attacker steals the uh, credentials of one of your developers, and now they get into the development environment, they don't care any, any more of vulnerabilities, they can just do whatever they want, okay? and. We see actually most of most of the software supply chain attacks are when an attacker uh, replaces one final image with another final image that is dealt with, that is tampered. And here, what, what we are seeing, some of the stuff is uh, similar to what you recognized, Ron, like S-bombs are very important. And uh, it is one thing to generate an S-bomb, actually to generate an S-bomb, it's almost a commodity today. 
There are many open source uh, tools for this and uh, it, it is becoming more fundamental how you manage the SBOMs, how do you share the SBOMs, what do you make out of the SBOM? The SBOM is the JSON format. It's, it, it's useless only if you, buy, you, you build the different layers of security aspects over the SBOM, then it's becoming useful. Uh, so yeah, SBOMs are definitely a big thing in every new regulation that is going uh, out, both self-generated SBOMs and third-party SBOMs that you either get from your vendors or that you just get an image and then you need to scan them and then you generate this SBOM uh, uh, all, uh, for, for you. And also I just want to recognize that uh, there are many types of SBOM. You can take an SBOM from uh, the Git, from the SEM or from the build checkout or for a final image or from the admission controller and every SBOM that you're taking from a different place is a little bit different. It has uh, its own pros and cons, and um, the, the aggregated SBOM, so to speak, may, provides a better uh, picture of what's going on in the code, uh, both vulnerability-wise and license-wise. The other thing <clears throat> that is uh, gaining in the last two years a lot of traction is ASPM. I think that uh, this is, it might be what you meant when you talked about the DevSecOps uh, platform run um, in the more uh, wide, <laughs> not industry specific uh, uh, world. Uh, this is referred to uh, as ASPM or Application Security Posture Management. And this is one place where you ingest and orchestrate all the different scanners that you already have in place. And then there are the, the, the more uh, newer frameworks and the methodologies that are out there mainly by uh, OpenSSF and by the regulators. The talks uh, the talk about um, how you make products secure by design and by default. And it's not exactly shift left. Uh, shift left is really important, but what it means is uh, I, as a security I, a professional, don't understand a lot about <laughs> development, so I will let my developers deal with it. <laughs> but many times it does not work because the developers either don't, don't understand security or they don't care about security, they care about their KPIs, which is speed. And uh, even if it's done right, it's Again, it only covers the uh, known vulnerabilities <laughs> in components, and this is like 20% of the scope of the problem. So uh, a complementary approach is uh, SDLC governance using guardrails. And guardrails are policies uh, that are uh, many times policies as code that are used and implemented directly into the CICD in a manner that a, a product that does not adhere to the policies, to the blueprints that you have put in place that could be based on regulation, on customer requirements, or on your own secure SDLC policy, we just won't go through. And um, in, in many, in, in a very deep manner, uh, compliance is really part of it because a compliance, if you think about it, it's a bundle of policies. And if you can enforce, verify and enforce at different stages what the process of the development, uh, this bundle of policies, then you actually get an evidence-based compliance support automatically generated for every build, which is how modern compliance should be done. It's not SOC 2 or ISO 27001 that is done uh, once a year. This is what continuous compliance is about. It's about attesting to the trustworthiness of your product continuously at, for every stage, for every build. And I think that the last piece in the puzzle, and this is also not really about vulnerabilities, it's about uh, how to do tampering detection, how to detect unlawful or unwillingful <laughs> changes, either in the code, in your product, 
like uh, it has been done in the solar winds uh, case or uh, in the XZ utils uh, case where they have uh, changed uh, um, the, the code during the build process. And for this, no scanner in the world will help you. It's not about SEA, it's not about SAS, it's not about us. Uh, the only way to really understand if your Jenkins configuration file has been tampered or if your build uh, process has been exploited is to uh, monitor and track the integrity and the provenance of the code components, of the processes, of the tools that generate the code of the machinery at every stage continuously and sign everything all the time, including the context. And then you can see that an image is not the result of your build. It might be the result of somebody else's build, maybe the attacker, or that uh, somebody changed your configuration file during the build process, etc. like the, the most sophisticated stuff. So I think that uh, these uh, these approaches that uh, are, are not coming from the traditional AppSec, but they are built on top of the traditional AppSec, on top of the traditional AppSec ops, and uh, we see them uh, starting to uh, gain a lot of traction in the finance sector and in the highly regulated sectors in defense, in the aviation, and others. And uh, they are making their way slowly but surely <laughs> into the automotive industry as well. And um, that's where my two cents. Um, being respectful, respectful of your time and our audience time, I think it's a good time to move to the summary phase. And uh, Arun, you you started, so I will let you uh, <laughs> start the the, conclu the concluding remarks. Uh, how do you see the future? How, where, is, where is this going? Uh, as automotive cybersecurity evolves, uh, the uh, following 10 key tenets will be essential as we move forward on our journey all together. Number one, mobilize security and privacy by design and default as a core tenet, and both of you talked about it earlier, to which I'll add, Zero trust rising. Uh, I think you talked about Ruby. Zero trust is absolutely essential, right? Uh, number two, build a common framework for third party risk and audit management across the supply chain. Because uh, when we have that, it will be much more uh, better way to establish the provenance and the end to end safer uh, software assurance. Third, adopt uh, multi-layered cybersecurity defenses to combat cyber attacks and prevent intrusion, right? <clears throat> Four, uh, I think you talked about that, Ran, earlier. Uh, design and deploy risk-based prioritization for safety-critical vehicle control systems. Five is plan rapid incident detection response because you've got to protect lives, mitigate damage, and recover rapidly. And I think sharing best practices and, and playbooks across manufacturers and the supply chain be very beneficial there. Uh, six, support cyber resiliency via robust and safe architectures. There is no choice. Human lives are at stake. And seven, uh, you know, remember the trifecta of people, process, and technology, right? It's not just a software problem or uh, sensors and yeah. hardware. And it is a people and and business process like third party risk management and so on. And number eight is foster intelligence and information sharing across the industry, nationally where you are, but also globally across nations. I think we can all win if we believe in the power of federation better together. Nine is you know collaborate for quick adoption of industry wide lessons learned across the automotive industry. If something bad happens. What do we implement? Share with everyone so people can be faster and more resilient. And last of all, I think promoting consumer awareness uh, and making them better informed and enabling manufacturer differentiation by cybersecurity capability can help uh, really increase uh, the value to the consumer to build the trust that you talked about, Ran, 
and uh, deliver the the value and assurance that you talk ruby uh, i think it's paramount thank you thank you arun uh, very good insights thank you for sharing them uh, ran can you provide your uh, your view of uh, <laughs> of the industry trends and what's uh, ahead of us i'll take the compliance uh, view uh, okay I'll, I'll echo everything that arun said i i 100 uh, agree with everything he said from a regulatory perspective i would say that we'll see a little bit of harmonization uh, across the different regions i don't think they you know having different uh regulations across in, in different countries uh can, can you know, stay like this but more importantly we see, we will see probably stricter uh standards specifically tailored for the automotive industry uh like you said uh ruby uh regulation specific for uh specific to autonomous driving uh and 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 aspects like that i i i believe that this is the next step especially when autonomous driving will become a little bit more of a reality uh and we'll probably see uh additional uh uh again growing uh attack surfaces like v2x communications and other aspects like that it will also be uh, uh covered by uh regulations over the air updates that are becoming uh, more and more uh relevant from a data privacy you know, that you both mentioned before uh we will see not just gdpr we'll see the equivalent of gdpr in uh in the automotive industry there's no way around it uh it's a critical element the third aspect of the two sides of the coin of the coin we'll need to find uh, an analogy with three sides not a coin is not good enough now uh and another thing that you mentioned that i would like to echo uh supply chain integrity there's no way around it it's critical in the automotive industry so i completely agree that it will, will be another important element as well as collaboration like Arun said we'll see all of this very soon I suspect. excellent okay my, my summary is a joke <laughs> so I, I remember that uh, I, I vaguely remember that uh, in the 90s there was a kind of a debate between uh, Steve Jobs who was the CEO of Microsoft uh, sorry not uh, Steve Jobs uh, Bill Gates sorry uh, CEO of Microsoft and the uh, a leader in the automotive industry. I don't remember who he was. I think maybe the CEO of General Motors. I'm not sure about it. And the the, the automotive leader, uh, if you remember uh, back then in the 90s, it, we had the Windows 3.11 that crashed all the time and we had blue screens. So the automotive leader uh, joked about uh, Microsoft and said that, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> If uh, that, uh, uh, sorry, it, it, it was the other way around. Uh, 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 Bill Gates joked about the automotive industry, how slow it moves, how uh, that uh, it embraces the new innovation very, very slowly. And it takes like uh, eight years or 10 years to get a new model to, to the road. And uh, because they have such strict POA uh, and safety requirements. And then the automotive leaders uh, talked about uh, Microsoft and said that if they had Microsoft standards for QA and, and uh, um, then uh, the, the car would break uh, every day. And in order to restart, to restart it, you need to close and open again all the windows. Uh, and, and I think that we got there, right? I mean, now it just combined. I mean, a car is in many in many aspects, it's a computer, right? And the same standards that you once uh, applied to um, software and IT and OT and IoT, now they just applied to cars and vice versa. The standards that you need to apply to car uh, safety-wise needs to be... Um, um needs still to be to be there uh, and uh, when these two very different industries meets uh, then 
interesting interesting thing happen and I think that uh, solution wise at least we are going to see all the best practices that you see from every software vendor from Microsoft from Google from Amazon from startups uh, making their way into the automotive industry run you talked about SaaS and das and SA and all the application security and we are going to see a flood of of software supply chain security making the way just uh, as they making the way to any industry that software is a big part of it okay uh, gentlemen it's been a pleasure thank you very much for being with us and uh, hope to see you in person uh, soon thank you thank you Ryan thank you Ruby. thank you everyone it was a real pleasure pleasure